I just loved the title, Spoils of War, The Treasures, Trophies and Trivia of the British Empire. Um, it just sounds intriguing, really, doesn't it? So I am very much looking forward to this evening. Uh, just a couple of admin points just before I introduce uh, Christopher. Uh, please, if you want to ask a question, just move your cursor down at the bottom. You've got uh, the bar will come up and you get the Q&A. So uh, the Q&A function, if you have a question, please do um, please do click on that and uh, type your question and we'll try and get through as many as we can as uh, no doubt this fascinating uh, speech lecture will uh, generate. And uh, please do note that uh, this this event is being recorded. So. Um, so f first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce Christopher. One more slide and then hand over pretty pronto to Christopher. Christopher is, has, I've just been joking, has the classic, classic army officer background. He was Oxford, Sandhurst, uh, household cavalry, and then into the city. So, uh, but he does have one, one particular uh, redeeming grace is he does have a link to the Royal Air Force. Thank God his father was a Battle of Britain pilot. So, and uh, no doubt, uh, Christopher, you're next door anyway in uh, the Next Door Club quite frequently. Uh, and in 2017, he, he became the historian for the Household Cavalry. So uh, that is his background. But after his uh, city career, he started writing. And that is his, his love of writing. And uh, this is his latest book. If you could just do the next slide, please, Christopher. Uh, as I say, just intriguing, and I, I, I asked to uh, host this because I wanted to see this speech from the moment I saw it, the Spoils of War, Treasures, Trophies and Trivias of the British Empire. And please note that two pounds per copy is going to uh, towards the, uh, the club's COVID uh, appeal. Uh, but actually, please buy the book. Uh, I'll save you the plug, Christopher. Please do buy the book uh, because we're very fortunate to have such an esteemed um, speaker. He speaks on Viking cruises and a number of other uh, esteemed uh, places. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Christopher. Over to you, my dear chap. Well, John, thank you very much indeed. And good evening to all of you out there in Zoom land. Now, uh, I need to start this talk with a spoiler alert. Because of the nature of aerial warfare, RAF spoils are rather thin on the ground. Uh, the Army has tens of thousands of them, the Navy has thousands, but RAF spoils of war are rather rare, which is probably why this, there we go, BF110G tailplane sold for such a lot of money in 2015. You can see it went for 111 pounds thousand pounds at auction. And I also have to tell you, and that explains the question mark on the right of the slide, that one of the RAF spoils of war that I've identified and included in this talk is probably not a spoil of war at all. But that's something for later. In the meantime, welcome to this controversial and largely misunderstood subject. Now I say controversial and misunderstood because even in the highest reaches of politics and the museum world, there is a sad lack of understanding about the difference between legitimate spoils of war and illegitimate loot. And this misunderstanding is distorting massively the current debate on restitution and repatriation, which is distorted enough already by the PC views of the Wokes and the historical revisionists. Now, I think it's always helpful in such debates to start by defining terms. So here are the dictionary definitions. And herein lies the vital distinction between legitimate spoils of war and illegitimate loot. Spoils are profits, loot is nothing more nor less than theft. And this is a distinction which the military recognizes as the next two slides illustrate. Here on the left, you see French eagles captured at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, being laid at the podgy feet of the Prince Regent. He consigned these potent symbols of victory to the Royal Hospital Chelsea, shown on the right, which is the national repository for battlefield trophies. 
in stark contrast, this is a notice placed on German property by the British Army at the end of the Second World War. Clearly, the military understands the difference between spoils and loot. And in case you doubt this statement, let me start by telling you about the First Duke of Wellington's attitude to and actions with regard to this subject. Now, it's a simple fact that the Iron Duke absolutely deplored looting, and there are tales of it driving him into a great rage. The reason for the Duke's rage was that not only did he regard looting as theft, but more importantly, it got in the way of fighting. After the Battle of Vittoria in 1813, Wellington came very close to ordering the 18th Hussars, shown here in the top right of the slide, back to England for plundering King Joseph Bonaparte's baggage train. You can see the King's uh, carriage in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. And they did this instead of pursuing the French as Wellington had ordered. Now, to be fair to the British troops, in the baggage train, they found 40 million gold francs. But it wasn't just gold that Joseph had taken from Madrid. He'd also comprehensively looted, and I use the term advisedly, the royal palace. This looting included rolling up and stashing in his coach the smaller pictures from the legitimate King of Spain's old master collection, shown here now at Apsley House, and discovered by Henry Wyndham on the right, who would later make his name at Hougmont. Now, this collection, which included three Titians, was sent to Wellington, who in turn attempted to return the pictures to their rightful owner. Wellington actually wrote three letters to King Ferdinand, shown here on the left, offering to return the paintings to Madrid. Fortunately for Wellington's heirs, a reply was received by Count Fernand Nunes, the Spanish minister in London, shown on the right, which said, His Majesty, touched by your delicacy, does not wish to deprive you of that which has come into your possession by means as just as they are honourable. As proof of his view that looting was no better than theft, Wellington not only tried, albeit unsuccessfully, to return the King of Spain's pictures, but he also organized the repatriation of much of Napoleon's European loot after the Allied victory at Waterloo in 1815. However, and it's not a contradiction, at the same time, the First Duke supported the capture of spoils of war. These included the contents of Tipu Sultan's palace and treasury after the Battle of Seringapatam in 1799, which produced an absolutely massive haul of tiger-themed spoils, some of which I illustrate in this slide, including, top left, a mechanical organ now in the V&A, bits from Tipu's gold and jewel-encrusted throne, which are now at Poe's Castle in the Royal Collection and elsewhere, and an assortment of cannons and other weapons. Wellington was also, as I've already mentioned, very keen on the acquisition of battlefield trophies, such as the French Eagle of the 105th Regiment of the Line, shown here being captured at Waterloo, and now in the National Army Museum. And he also supported the monetization of spoils of war acquired on the battlefield through prize auctions, about which more in a moment. So, if senior military commanders understand the difference between loot and spoils, why do politicians and museum curators have such difficulties? I believe that the answer lies in an examination of both the items in question and the circumstances in which they were acquired, a representative cross-section of which I've included in my book. However, rather than subject you to a precy of the contents of this mighty tome, I'm instead going to use some of its contents as a way of challenging your perceptions of the subject and I propose to do this by starting you on the battlefield and then moving you progressively away from the cannon's roar, whilst reminding you once again that spoils of war are any profits arising from victory, whilst loot is theft. So let's start on the battlefield first with these items, acquired by the British at Rourke's Drift in 1880, and now in the Museum of the Royal Welsh 
and in the collection of a descendant of Lieutenant Gonville Brumhead, VC. Are these shields and spears spoils of war, or are they loot? The answer to that question may lie in the fact that the Zulus have never asked for them back. In fact, far from whinging about the loss of their historical and cultural artifacts, the present Zulu king has celebrated the epic struggle at the mission statement as a guest of the successor regiment to the 24th Regiment of Foot, as illustrated in these photos taken a couple of years ago at the Royal Welsh's Regimental Museum in Brecon. This is by no means the only example in my book of battlefield trophies whose return has never been demanded. For example, the French have never asked for the return of these silver kettle drums taken from them on the battlefield of Dettingen in 1743 and ever since paraded at the head of a British Hussar regiment. Nor have the Russians asked for the return of the figurehead of the Malodits captured during the Crimean War and now at Arundel Castle. Nor have the Chinese asked for the return of this drum taken during the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion in 1899 and now in a museum at Carnarvon Castle in North Wales. And what about the Emperor Napoleon's iconic charger, Marengo, who was found lying on the battlefield of Waterloo? He was acquired by a British officer who nursed the horse back to health and then took him to England. Has the French government or Napoleon's heirs ever asked for the return of the horse's skeleton, now in the National Army Museum, or its front hooves, one of which is in the Household Cavalry Museum and the other in the Queen's Guard Officer's Mess at St James's Palace? The answer is no. Perhaps more surprisingly, the United States government has never asked for the return of colours captured by Colonel Banasta Tarleton during the American War of Independence. This was of enormous benefit to Tarleton's descendant, who in 2017 sold them at auction in New York to a private American buyer for $17.5 million. In fact, when it comes to items taken from or found on the field of battle, there is only one category of spoils for which there has ever been a persistent demand for repatriation. Although interestingly, the requests invariably come from the military, not from the Ministry of Culture. The spoils in question are the aforementioned French Imperial Eagles, for which the British have a rather large collection, only some of which I'm showing here. Now in researching my book, I found many requests from the French army for their return, and only one example of a temporary loan. Indeed, the British military's attitude to this subject is best summed up by the successors to the Royal Scots Greys, who, as shown in this slide, captured the Eagle of the 45th Regiment at Waterloo. Their answer is invariably, and I won't attempt a Scottish accent, if you want it, come and get it. It would be a very brave man who took up that challenge. I want to move now from the battlefield to the immediate aftermath of battle and the surrounding real estate on which our troops found many trophies, most of which were neither weapons nor equipment. Here too, I've discovered little appetite for their return. Take, for example, Hitler's desk, taken from the Führer bunker at the end of the battle for Berlin in 1945 and now in the Keep Museum in Dorchester. Or what about these in the top left-hand corner? Eva Braun's knickers, found by American troops at Hitler's ruined Berghof. Or this rather handsome chair, taken at the fall of Sevastopol in 1855, and now in the Cheshire Military Museum in Chester. Neither Frau Merkel nor President Putin appear to be threatening sanctions if their respective nation's furniture and underwear is not returned nor have the descendants of Joseph Bonaparte, or indeed the French government, asked for the return of this particular household item, which was captured by the 14th Hussars at the Battle of Vittoria and has been used ever since, and presumably after a good scrub, as a loving cup in the Hussars officers' mess. And speaking of items in officers' messes, what about the painting hanging in your bar 
and known as the Blue Boy. For some of you may know, it's a mid 19th century French school painting of a young boy who is probably a member of the de Berry family, the seigneurs of Upper and Lower Fouilly, from whose chateau the painting was removed in 1918. At first sight, it's a wholly unremarkable painting of the sort that might achieve a hammer price at auction of a few hundred pounds if it was lucky. However, on further inspection, you'll see that the blue boy's blouse is adorned with pilot's wings above three British First World War campaign medal ribbons. More remarkable still, he wears a khaki officer's hat, which bears the badge of the Royal Air Force. In addition, a tiny white-coated terrier can be seen in the lower left corner of the canvas. Now, these adornments are clearly an overpaint, but how did they come to be there? And how did the painting end up in your club? The answer is that during the Ludendorff Offensive of spring 1918, the Germans initially secured a significant amount of territory, including the Chateau de Fouilly, which had been the headquarters of the Royal Flying Corps' Five Brigade. However, the Germans failed to make their hoped for breakthrough, and by the 2nd of September, their front line had been rolled back to the Hindenburg Line, and the Chateau de Fouilly was once again Five Brigade's headquarters. Now, it's not clear from the records of the club whether the Blue Boy was removed from the chateau after the spring offensive or before. But whatever the precise dates of the picture's acquisition by the RAF, it was presented to the Royal Air Force Club in 1922 to adorn the walls of your new premises on Piccadilly, thereby becoming the first painting in the club's collection. Now, what about the terrier in the bottom left-hand corner of the painting? What on earth is it doing there? One possible explanation is that the dog was the mascot of either Five Brigade or one of its squadrons. Royal Flying Corps and RAF units had plenty of mascots, including an eagle, a goat, and a fox, which was, subs which was frequently taken into combat and was said to enjoy flying. Now for the difficult bit. Although no one has asked for the return of this painting, Based on the Duke of Wellington's criteria, the blue boy is loot and should be returned. But if you take my advice, I'd wait until somebody asks you for it. So if your painting is loot, what about the Raffwaffer? Now, for those of you who don't know about this unit, it was established on the 21st of November, 1941 at RAF Duxford as number 146 enemy aircraft flight initially staffed with maintenance test pilots from number 41 group and equipped with German aeroplanes captured from the Luftwaffe. Its purpose was to allow the RAF to evaluate enemy aircraft and to demonstrate their characteristics to allied personnel. Needless to say, number 1426 flight was quickly nicknamed the Raffwaffe. Initially, there were three aeroplanes in the flight. A Heinkel HE-111 bomber shot down in Scotland in February 1940, a Messerschmitt Bf-109 captured during the Battle for France, and a Junkers Ju-88A-5 bomber, a surprise acquisition made when its inept Luftwaffe pilot made a nighttime landing at RAF Chivener in the belief, at least that's what he said, that it was an airfield in France. Raffwaffer's first enemy aircraft recognition tour at British airfields commenced in mid-February 1942 and lasted for two weeks. It was swiftly followed by sound recordings for the RAF film unit. This was the, RAF, this was the Raffwaffer's first, but by no means its last exposure to the glamorous world of the cinema. Further tours were made in successive months, during one of which the Raffwaffer's Ju-88 was photographed by the Two Cities Film Company for use in Noel Coward's morale-boosting film, In Which We Serve. But this was by no means the end of the Raffwaffer's role on the silver screen, and was followed by performances in several feature and documentary films. However, the Raffwaffer's role as movie stars was interrupted on the 27th of May 
when the flight was inspected by no less a personage than King George VI and Queen Elizabeth whilst it was at RAF Digby. But it wasn't there for long. On the 7th of July, the RAF offers JU-88 and Heinkel 111 were flown to United States Air Force Polebrook to enable the King of Hollywood, Captain Clark Gable, shown on the right, to make an instructional film for US Army Air Force air gunners. However, rubbing shoulders with British and American royalty was not the RAF Waffer's only role. Like all established film stars, the flight also performed for charity. Uh, when they flew it to Hatfield for nine days of display flying, organized by de Havilland in aid of the RAF Benevolent Fund. Back on the red carpet, this was followed with a second booking by Two Cities Film Company, although the shoot was canceled because of bad weather. And actually in the event, this was the RAF Waffer's last chance to appear in front of the camera. With the Allies advancing across Europe and the end of the war in sight, number 1426 flight RAF was disbanded on the 17th of January, 1945. However, one of their spoils of war, a Messerschmitt BF-109E, can still be seen at the RAF Museum in Hendon, along with three other German aeroplanes surrendered at the end of the European War in May 1945. Like Hitler's desk and Eva Braun's knickers, none of these aeroplanes has ever been the subject of a repatriation request. So, if with the exception of eagles, there is no appetite on the part of defeated nations for the repatriation or restitution of spoils of war from the battlefield and its immediate surroundings, wherein do the problems lie for Britain's museum? The answer seems to be with spoils of war acquired at prize auctions and under peace treaties. Now let's start by looking at the British military system of prize auctions, which started in the 18th century and lasted through until the end of the 19th, and were analogous to, but not the same as, the Royal Navy's system of prize courts. Few images exist of prize auctions. You see here the one held in Peking, the top left, in 1860, and the other on the right after the Benin expedition of 1896. But they all ran along much the same lines. In the immediate aftermath of a battle, or at the successful conclusion of a siege, the commanding general would appoint a prize committee headed by a prize agent, whose job was to gather together anything on the battlefield or in the captured town that could be moved and that had belonged to the, the enemy military. These items would be gathered together, catalogued, and then sold at a prize auction to the highest bidder. The proceeds of the sale would then be divided up amongst the victorious soldiers according to rank. Up until the middle of the 19th century, the bidders at these auctions would, more often than not, be officers with cash to spare and a nose for a bargain. Sometimes the officers pooled their prize money and bought a memento of the battle, such as these silver trumpets. The one on the left was commissioned by the 10th Hussars and one on the right by the 18th Hussars, with money received from the auction of French cavalry horses after Waterloo. Some spoils never made it to the auction because they'd been earmarked for the monarch, as in the case of this large mortar taken at Cadiz in 1812, the unveiling of which in London caused much ribaldry and was almost immediately christened the Prince Regent's bomb, pronounced bum, and Napoleonic memorabilia for which the Prince Regent had an insatiable appetite, including Napoleon's Mameluke dressing gown, now at Windsor Castle, and a pair of silver gilt chamber pots that unfortunately have since disappeared. Other items, such as cannons, tended to be earmarked for the Board of Ordnance, who placed these trophies in prominent locations, such as Tipu Sultan's Tiger Cannons here at the RMA Sandhurst on the left, and these Waterloo cannon on the right, which are located at the Tower of London. Or they would use the metal to create monuments to the victor, such as the Wellington Monument at Hyde Park Corner, which was cast from French cannons and paid for, somewhat unlikely paid for, by the ladies of England. Um, I say that because of what's now going to follow. 
You may be amused to learn that when the monument was unveiled without a fig leaf, it caused a considerable stir, given not only that it had been paid for by the ladies of England, but that the face on the statue was that of the notoriously randy Iron Duke himself. In looking at prize auctions, it's important to note that from the mid 19th century onwards, representatives of British museums would also attend and bid, and in one case that I'll come to in a moment, the auction was actually held in London rather than at the site of the battle, thereby attracting foreign buyers as well. This was good news for the soldiery, but has caused problems for posterity. Probably the best known of these auctions and the ones that I've caught, the ones that have caused the most trouble ever since were those that followed clockwise from the top left, the end of the Second Opium War in 1860, the Battle of Magdala in 1868, the capture of Mandalay in the bottom right in 1885, and the Benin and the Benin expedition of 1897. Now, in order to help you reach a judgment as to whether or not museums should continue to hold spoils resulting from these conflicts, let's look at each one of them in turn, starting with the sacking of the old summer palace in Peking, which marked the effective end of the Second Opium War in 1860. Now this act of destruction was not wanton, but a carefully considered act of punishment by Lord Elgin and his French counterpart de Montauban for the simply appalling atrocities deliberately inflicted on a European diplomatic mission under a flag of truce, who were treacherously imprisoned in the board of punishment, brutally tortured, and then painfully executed on the direct orders of the legitimate Chinese government. The Old Summer Palace was in fact, a complex of palaces set in 350 acres of highly manicured gardens. And as shown here at an exhibition in Paris in 1862, each building was absolutely stuffed full of the accumulation of hundreds of years of collecting by the Chinese emperors. And some of the items were over 3000 years old. The prize auction produced some really quite extraordinary spoils of war, including these items, which have subsequently been sold at various times for literally hundreds of thousands of pounds and have included successful Chinese bids to recover several of them. The most notable being five of the bronze heads from the water clock. Also included from, of, in the spoils from the old summer palace was a Pekingese dog. This belonged to the Chinese Empress and it was presented to Queen Victoria who immediately, but rather unhelpfully, named him Lucy and had him immortalized in oils. So should all the contents of the old summer palace, at least those in public collections, as shown here um, uh, at Fontainebleau, be sent back to Beijing on the grounds that with 21st century hindsight, the destruction of the old summer palace and the sale of its contents may not have been a proportionate response to the horrors perpetrated by the Chinese. Before you formulate an answer, let's turn now to the prize auction after the Battle of Magdala in 1868. Now this was even more problematic given, that the rather, given the rather underwhelming reason for the launch of the punitive expedition in the first place. In a nutshell, Emperor Theodore II of Abyssinia, shown here on the left, in order to try and gain the attention of the British government, somewhat ill-advisedly imprisoned a number of British subjects without charge. This action backfired on the emperor in quite spectacular fashion when, instead of a diplomatic mission to secure the release of the imprisoned Brits, we sent an Anglo-Indian army of 13,000 men under the command of General Napier to rescue the hostages. Emperor Theodore's army was easily defeated at the cost of just two British soldiers. The prisoners were released unharmed from the fortress of Magdala and Emperor Theodore then shot himself with a pistol given to him in happier times by Queen Victoria herself. So great was the Abyssinian Hall of Spoils placed on sale at the prize auction that it required nearly 15 elephants and nearly 200 mules to transport the lots to the plain of Delanta below the burning fortress. 
prize auction included hundreds of historical manuscripts collected by the late emperor, as well as his imperial regalia. Of particular significance in the history of spoils of war and the current debate about repatriation are the emperor's crowns and a book called The Glory of Kings. Saga is too long to recount here in detail, though you can of course read about it in full in my book, but in summary, the British government wanted to ingratiate itself with Theodore's successor and at his request, repatriated the glory of kings, a sort of Abyssinian almanac de Gotha, which established the emperor's right to reign and was held by the British Museum. 50 years later, again for purely political reasons, one of Theodore's crowns held in the V&A was also returned. Now, importantly for the current debate, these items were the property of the colonial office, not of the museum, and so didn't have to be deaccessioned, which usually requires an act of parliament. Nevertheless, their return has set a precedent that the V&A in particular is finding it hard to resist. Should they give in to these demands? Again, don't answer that question until you've considered the prize auction that followed the capture of Mandalay in Burma, which ended the third and last Anglo-Burmese War of 1885. The rights and wrongs of this conflict needn't detain us here, but what you do need to know is that, as at Magdala, the prize auction that followed included the portable contents of King Thibaw Min's several palaces, including all the royal regalia and the gilded lion throne along with uh, several other thrones that were in the Amarapura Palace. Now the Lion Throne was taken to India where it remained until Burma's independence in 1948. And the Royal Regalia, shown on the right, was sent to the V&A where it was conserved, catalogued and displayed until 1964 when once again for political reasons, it was returned to Burma. As with the Magdala spoils, the repatriation was possible because these spoils were government, not museum property. However, and herein lies a key argument against repatriation, the seven thrones that were not removed from Mandalay were all destroyed during the Second World War, and the Burmese government not only thanked the V&A for preserving the royal regalia, but gave it back two of the items that, it had, been, that had been returned to it. Which brings me to the prize auction held after the Benin punitive expedition of 1897. Now, unusually, although the spoils were assembled in Benin, the actual auction was held in London and the proceeds were used to defray the costs of the expedition, which had been launched to avenge the so-called Benin massacre in which a small force of British trying to enforce previously negotiated trading rights were ambushed and slaughtered to a man. The sacking of Benin City by the expeditionary force and the removal and auction of the many items of bronze, ivory and wood found there was further justified when it became very apparent to the horror of the Victorians, but not it would seem to 21st century moralists, that the citizens of Benin were very much given to human sacrifice. In defense of this now highly controversial confiscation, I'd like to add this thought. If Benin City had not been comprehensively stripped of its cultural heritage, where would the Benin bronzes and other Benin artifacts now be? I think we can assume that whilst under British rule, they would undoubtedly have remained in Nigeria until independence in 1960. But what would have happened to them after that, given the Nigerian civil war and the succession of corrupt governments by which Nigeria has since been ruled? I suggest to you that the Benin bronzes and other artifacts would have suffered the same fate as treasures in other unstable countries that have been sold on the international art market or destroyed in conflict. And if that isn't enough of an argument, compare and contrast the number of people who've seen the bronzes in Western museums by comparison with the number who might have seen them in Nigeria or who would see them there in future. Indeed, 
I dread to think what will happen if the Belgian and French governments go ahead with their promise to return spoils of war to the Congo and other unstable sub-Saharan countries. So what I'm saying is that even if you apply 21st century moral standards to 19th century military actions, which I personally believe is both meaningless and intellectually dishonest, then there still remains the powerful arguments around accessibility and conservation. Instead of bemoaning the present ownership of the Benin bronzes, we should be celebrating the fact that they have not gone the way of the Burmese thrones, the Buddhas of Bamiyan, or the temples of Bel and Nabu. Now, I know that I won't have convinced all of you on this subject, but before I take your questions, we still have to consider the question of spoils of war arising from international treaties. Take a brief look at loot, and I want to end by telling you about one further RAF trophy. Now, to judge from the recent rumpus in Westminster and Brussels about the government legalizing possible breaches of the EU withdrawal treaty, the terms of a treaty are sacrosanct. And if that is correct, then the return of Gibraltar and the Koh-i-Noor diamond, to name just the two at the top of the list, can be rejected out of hand. Gibraltar was ceded to us in perpetuity in 1713 under the Treaty of Utrecht, and the Koh-i-Noor diamond was surrendered to the British Crown under Article 3 of the Treaty of Lahore of 1846. Now let's turn to the grey area between loot and spoils of war, whilst reminding ourselves that spoils are the profits of war and loot is nothing less than theft. To get the ball rolling again, let's consider some of the events of the Second World War, at the start of which Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering said, I intend to plunder and to do it thoroughly, and then proceeded to acquire by force 25% of the art heritage of occupied Europe, just a fraction of which is shown here in storage after the war, and only 50% of which has been returned to its rightful owners or their descendants. Is anyone in the audience in any doubt that this vast accumulation of art was anything other than loot? I think not, and I hope not. Very well, let's look at a possible gray area of the subject. In 1945, the first household cavalry regiment, uh, a composite regiment formed from the Life Guards and the Royal Horse Guards, was pushing deep into Western Germany. Regimental law is not clear as to where or how 1HCR, as it was known, acquired a wooden maquette for a life-size or larger statue of a naked man and woman. However, the Dry Roger, as the statue was immediately christened by Louche lifeguards, has been proudly and prominently displayed in the officer's house ever since. In the years following the war, this mildly erotic statue traveled with the regiment to Singapore and back via Palestine, where it was not improved by immersion in a bath, and to Cyprus, where the lady's toes were chipped. At various times, enterprising officers with an eye for anatomical detail have attempted to add some genital embellishments in cork. Despite all of this, the Dry Roger has survived virtually in its original state. But is it a spoil of war or like your blue boy, loot? Before you decide, consider this item. Uh, currently acting as a desk in headquarters household division at Horse Guards. It was taken after the war ended by five guards armored brigade from a hotel on the banks of the Rhine called the Rhine Hotel Driessen, which was Hitler's favorite holiday resort. And he's said to have stayed in this hotel more than 70 times and he even had his own permanent suite there. And it was in that room and over this particular bureau plat that in 1938, Neville Chamberlain negotiated the so-called Bad Goddesberg Agreement a failed precursor to the Munich Agreement of the following week. The hotel still exists. So if the Bureau is, uh, if the Bureau is loot, should it be returned to the hotel? Or do you think um, it should uh, stay where it is? 
Now, even if it is a legitimate spoil of war, it wasn't actually acquired on the battlefield. So what about this? This is a German Admiral's baton known as an Admiral's tab, and it belonged to this gentleman, Grand Admiral Dernitz. And it's now in a museum in Shrewsbury and was taken from him when he was arrested in Flensburg on the 23rd of May, 1945. Before his suicide, Hitler named Dönitz as his successor as president, a post the Grand Admiral held for 14 days, and which was followed by his trial at Nuremberg, where he was found guilty on two counts of planning, initiating and waging wars of aggression, and committing crimes against the laws of war, but was acquitted, acquitted of crimes against humanity. Now, we'd have let him go, but the Soviets insisted that he spent 10 years in Spandau prison from where he was released on the 1st of October, 1956. The ex-Grand Admiral lived in retirement for the next 24 years, dying on Christmas Eve, 1980, aged 89. And in his will, despite the fact that he'd been relieved of his baton in 1945, he bequeathed it to a German naval veterans organization. This was the Deutsche Marinebund and the will specified that the baton was to be displayed by the Marinebund in the German Submarine Services Naval Memorial and Museum near Kiel, shown on the right. No sooner was the will published than the veteran German submariners promptly demanded that it was the, uh, its return on the grounds that it was the personal possession of the late Grand Admiral and therefore could not be deemed a spoil of war. After consulting with their lawyers, who ruled that the baton was a legitimate spoil of war, the Shropshire Regimental Museum repl replied with a firm nine, and there the matter has been allowed to rest. However, whilst on the subject of the German Navy, I think it's appropriate to end this talk with a really bizarre story concerning a long-running inter-squadron dispute over the ownership of a naval spoil of war. When the Second World War broke out in 1939, the two German ships most feared by the British were the battleships Bismarck and Tirpitz. On the 24th of May 1941, Bismarck sank the unsinkable British battleship Hood. In retaliation, Prime Minister Winston Churchill famously issued his order to the Royal Navy, sink the Bismarck, which was achieved three days later on the 27th of May. Lest a similar fate befall the Tirpitz, Hitler ordered that she be hidden in the fjords of Norway, where she remained a significant threat to the vital Arctic convoy routes to Soviet Russia. The Tirpitz was attacked many times, including once by British midget, midget submariners in 1943. Actually, they weren't midget submariners, they were on a midget submarine. But although severely damaged, she remained afloat. Finally, in 1944, it was decided to sink the ship <clears throat> using 12,000 pound tall boy bombs. And on the 12th of November, 1944, in the final of three attacks by the RAF, Lancaster bombers from nine and 617 squadrons flew from RAF Lossiemouth to destroy the ship. Tirpitz was hit by only two out of the 29 tall boys dropped, but nonetheless capsized in the shallows of Tromso Fjord. The final and decisive bomb, and this is important to this story, was delivered by Nine Squadron. In 1947, a Norwegian company was salvaging the Tirpitz for scrap when the salvage workers discovered that the German crew had painted a representation of the ship on one of the propeller shaft bulkheads. Now this bulkhead, as you can see, was pretty large. It weighed over 100 kilos and measured 1.2 by 1 metre. It had just been removed from the ship, not by the matelots shown here, when by chance a former member of Nine Squadron called Jeep Jensen happened to be visiting Tromso. He heard about the bulkhead and told the local authorities that if it ever became available, it would be much appreciated by Nine Squadron. The mayor of Tromso passed the story to the Norwegian government, and in November 1949, the bulkhead was presented to the Royal Air Force. And it was put on display at RAF Binbrook, where, unfortunately, 
both 9 Squadron and 61 Squadron were then based. This turned out to be a very unfortunate coincidence, for soon after the trophy arrived at the RAF station, 9 Squadron removed it from station headquarters and placed it in their own squadron building. In due course, 617 Squadron responded by, ra by raiding 9 Squadron and moving the bulkhead to a wall in their building. The raids and counter raids of the last remaining piece of the Tirpitz became an ongoing battle between the two squadrons, which there isn't enough time to recount here, although the full story is in my book. And if you don't know what happened, it's certainly well worth a read. Anyway, after some quite extraordinary tit for tat raids, finally in, in 1982, the bulkhead was secured by nine squadron for nine, by, for nine years. And in 1991, a team of 617 squadron described, uh, uh, sorry, my technology has again gone wrong at this end. Just give me a moment because I don't have the details in front of me. Well, I will go on and tell you. Basically, um, the tit for tat raids went on until finally uh, one of the squadrons actually nailed this, um, this bulkhead to the floor. They secured it with screws uh, and they welded the screws in place. And it, when they came to move, up to Lossiemouth, it finally took a, a team of navvies about four days to get it off from the floor. The tit for tat raids continued to be threatened until um, in the 1990s, it was agreed by both squadrons that this particular spoil of war could go on display at RAF Hendon, and there it is. And that brings me to the end of this talk. I'm sorry about the small technical problems we had, but I think you've got the bulk of it. And I'm now very happy to take any questions that you might have. John, over to you. Love that, uh, really fascinating. And uh, I tell you one thing, uh, being a RAF, you've raised a, a question, the 9617 argument is eternal. So we'll, uh, we'll see about uh, uh, that. So, um, right, I have loads of questions here. So uh, let me just go down. Uh, them. Um, lovely comments as well coming through. Brilliant talk already. So, uh, and the book will be bought. You'll love the sound of that. So, first question Is there any case to return to the original countries these spoils of war? Well, I rather hope I've made the case that in most cases there isn't. Um, providing their spoils of war are not loot, I think the practice of war over the last 300 years, in fact, going back a lot further than that, is that. If you capture something on or around the battlefield, it's yours to keep. Okay, thank you. Um, another one. Um, some fantastic examples of return of British spoils of war not being requested. So when we've taken them, are there examples of British losses which we have not requested back? Uh, yep, but of course, the history of the British Empire in particular is one of a fairly continuous story of success. So there aren't actually very many British spoils of war lying in foreign collections. But I can tell you that there are quite a few British colours from the 18th century that are still hanging in the Anvalide, and I'm sure we'd like them back. But I don't think anybody's actually ever asked for them. Um, there is one slightly silly story uh, that I can tell you about. Um, the Sword of Surrender, Cornwallis's Sword of Surrender, uh, given to the Americans at the end of the American War of Independence was thought for a very long time to be hanging in the White House. In point of fact, in a gesture that was about as good as putting two fingers up the British, uh, Washington actually gave it back to General Cornwallis and it's been sitting in his family's house um, in, uh, in, uh, in the East Country ever since. You know, that, that's just a mind because I asked my wife Helen earlier, uh, she got a question, she came up with the next one, you say, would, uh, and it follows on from this actually, because it is a British loss, um, would uh, GI brides be viewed as a, a spoil of war or is that looting by the Americans? <laughs> I couldn't possibly answer that <laughs> No, yes, let's not go there, I'll go on to a, pro a proper question, <laughs> sorry, just reminded me, there we go, how her mind works. Um, right. Could it be argued that in modern military campaigns, any profits from the spoils of war should be used to support veterans that campaign? Um, that's a very good question. The, the system of prize auctions was, in fact, a way of supporting veterans because soldiers got money. So 
cavalry horses, guns, cannon were sold, um, or in the case I gave you later of the, the big prize auctions, money went into the pockets of soldiers who'd been, who either had or had not been wounded, and indeed some money went back to widows and orphans. Of course, the prize auction system basically stopped um, before the, the Second Boer War. So in the 20th and 21st century, there had been no prize auctions, but there have still been plenty of um, spoils of war. I was in a museum fairly recently where there were a couple of Taliban motorbikes. You don't get much more recent than that. But no, I think what you see is that when prize auctions came to an end at the end of the 19th century, um, benevolence stepped into its place. So you got the, uh, first of all, the Royal British Legion, then of course the RAF Benevolent Fund, um, the Army Benevolent Fund, and so on. So I think the short answer, oh, the other thing that's also worth saying is that of course, what tends to get picked up on modern battlefields doesn't have any real value. Um, it's got value to the people that collect it, like a Taliban motorbike or a, a rifle or Saddam Hussein's dagger but um, they don't have real intrinsic value. Whereas stuff taken in the 17th, 18th and 19th century, as you've seen from my talk, uh, items in silver and gold, items made from jewelry, uh, they have very real value. Okay, thank you. Sorry, slightly long answer. No, no, fascinating. As I say, we've got loads of comments. You'll love the comments. We'll uh, pass them on to you. How would you respond to the proposition that spoils are theirs are theirs to destroy, not for us to preserve. Funnily enough, somebody put that to me in a debate I did on um, Dan Snow's TV channel, and I was gobsmacked. Um, I couldn't believe that a serious academic could say to me, not only should everything be returned to these countries, but that they could then do what they liked with them. So much of the spoils of war that are now in museums around the world are part of the world's cultural heritage. And it's right and proper that they're in places where they are conserved and can be seen. The idea of destroying them, I find um, deeply worrying. I've got one which is dot, 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 uh, on Argentina, but uh, it wasn't a full question. Uh, here's a classic one, which uh, I know I asked you over the phone when we, uh, we uh, first met. Where do you stand on the Elgins? They're not spoils of war, it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, I do happen to know a bit about the Elgin marbles. Um, they were bought from the Turkish governor of Athens by Lord Elgin. And the reason he bought them was because the marbles on the Parthenon were being um, taken away and ground down to make cement, cement for new houses in Athens. So he saved them and he bought them. They're not spoils of war. Um, you then get to the question of, well, in those days, even if it were spoils of war, which they're not, but in those days, um, Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> so if they're to go back to anybody, presumably they should go back to the Ottoman Empire who owned them. But the Ottoman Empire doesn't exist anymore, so that's modern day Turkey. And if you want to get into a really complicated argument, um, how about the Rosetta Stone, which definitely was a spoil of war, the Rosetta Stone was discovered by the French, taken as part of the peace treaty that ended the war in North Africa um, after Napoleon had legged it back to Paris and seized power as first consul. But the stone was actually created in the reign of Ptolemy, who was a Greek monarch of what was then Egypt. So where should the Rosetta Stone go back? I have no idea. Okay, you can tell you're Oxbridge. What degree were you, did you do? Law. Ah, oh, you see, that's why you know, you see, that's why <laughs> you see presenting your evidence. Fantastic. So actually, not actually legal question here, I suppose, in many respects. If something is loot, does the current possessor have a duty to reach out to return it or only if and when requested? Uh, that's a moral question, isn't it? Rather than a legal one. Um, okay. I would hope, particularly museums who are holding items of loot, particularly stuff that was looted by the Germans during the war, would have the decency to say, here it is, who does it belong to, and try and get it back to the rightful owners. Because what went on during World War II had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with 
with spoils of war and absolutely everything to do with loot. I'm assuming from what you said, because you said, what, 25% uh, of European uh, art was uh, looted, you saw, uh, by Goering, but only 50% of that has been returned. So you're saying, what, a, a good 12.5% uh, of European art that disappeared during World War II is um, still in people's houses or in bank vaults somewhere? Well, it's not quite as simple as that, John. Some of it was destroyed during the war. Mm -hmm. so we have to just accept that, you know, it went, it was bombed or it was shelled, who knows what. Yeah. What we do know, however, is that whereas the Allies set up the Monuments Men in 1945, whose job was to catalogue and return as much as they could, the Soviets said, no, this is reparations. We're keeping it all. So about 50%, about half of what Goering had taken ended up back, uh, of the stuff that survived, ended up back in Russia. And the Russians answer to any request for the return of that stuff, whether it was looted, whether it's spoils of war, whether it came from a German museum or from a Jewish house, doesn't matter. They're, they say the same every time. Sorry, it's reparations. Our country was devastated by the Germans. We're keeping it. If that lines with that, because I think you've answered that, what is still being done to restore Goering's booty uh, to rightful owners. But also, it says, also, what has happened about disputed houses taken from people in the Warsaw Pact countries, now Western countries? Um, that's, um, that's a very tricky question, and it depends on um, which particular country you're talking about. I I'm not an expert on this. Um, I do know, for example, that when East and West Germany reun were reunified, it was agreed that anything that had happened prior to reunification stood. So um, property that had been confiscated by the Nazis stayed confiscated. Um, property that had been confiscated by the Soviets stayed confiscated. In other parts of Eastern Europe, Hungary, for example, Czech Republic, um, I know for a fact that some of the big houses have been offered back to the families that originally owned them. Um, I know that in Hungary, there's always a condition attached and the condition is the foreign currency will be brought in to restore them. Okay. It seems uh, from some of your conversations, it seems, and this is uh, maybe slightly uh, com uh, controversial, but it seems that if you were wealthy uh, that it was a spoil of war, but it was it's sort of de Wellington's definition that they can loot from outside European countries because half the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, the ruling classes were, um, you know, related. So we didn't nick from European countries, but it was okay to take possessions from, let's say, African countries. But, but, uh, but it seems that loot was very much, if you were one of the men, that's loot, whereas the officers, it was spoils of war. No, John, I can, I'm afraid I completely disagree with you on that. Good, good. I, I was just trying to be confrontational. That, that is a complete misunderstanding of okay. what happened. Okay. I mean, basically, we didn't go to war in Europe between 1815 and 1914. Okay. So there was no opportunity for us to get European spoils of war. Mm -hmm. um, we spent that intervening period building up our empire, which is why most of the spoils of war from the 19th century are from non-European countries. But don't forget, there's a huge amount of Napoleonic spoils of war in British collections. Huge amount. Um, not, for, not just from Waterloo, but from all the other battles that we fought, we took loads of stuff back. Um, so no, I, I don't buy that for a moment. And the other thing is, I think that the system of prize auction was designed so that there was a redistribution. Um, and yes, it was a redistribution according to rank. And yes, Working classes tend to be ordinary soldiers and aristocrats tended to be officers. But I find that a pretty difficult argument to sustain. I don't think that was in the minds of the people who are doing the distributing. Okay, two final questions, if I may then. Uh, what about foreign property gained through defection in peacetime? E.g. an airman defects from another nation in an aircraft. If the pilot is granted asylum, what is the status of the aircraft? During conflict, I would it say- It says during peacetime. 
So yeah. I suppose you could say like the MiG-25 that went to Japan. I'm assuming, I didn't ask the question, but it's uh, like the MiG-25 that defected to Japan. Who owns that? Or is that just, uh, obviously we took it apart to see what that technology was about, I'm assuming, but. I think we gave it back after we'd taken it apart, didn't we? Or re-engineered, yes, probably. <laughs> so, no, I mean, th this is an extreme, extraordinarily difficult question and one that's really outside of my remit. Okay. And final question, uh, should museums explain how the spoils of war on display came to be in the museum? Yes, I think they should. And I yeah, think because it's would... part of the story, isn't it, really? Yeah, I mean, yeah. How, how, can, how can they not? You know, it would be extraordinary just to put something up on display without explaining it. And I think, you know, I spent a lot of time going around museums in the country. You, you may be surprised to know that whilst there are, what, four RAF museums, possibly more, four or five, there are 150 army museums. Yes, uh, but it's like your charities. We only have two, whereas I yeah. hate to count how many army charities there are. But uh, Probably rather more in the military. But yeah. the point I'm making is that these are absolutely stuff full of stuff. Yeah. But most of it's pretty well explained. I mean, there's very yeah. little that sits around was just sitting in a cabinet. I, think, yeah. I don't think I saw anything that wasn't properly explained. Yeah. I suspect that this, uh, just before you go, John, I, I suspect that this is, you know, this, this is verging into the talks about slavery and, uh, and the removal of statues and whether they should be removed or explained. I come down firmly on the side of they should stay where they are, but be properly explained. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, we've, oh, I've had a couple of comments about the turf pits, but I'm not even going to go there. Having spent 20 years in the Air Force, I know that argument is an ongoing argument. Um, but uh, apps, on behalf of everyone, absolutely fascinating. Must be because we've got loads of uh, uh, loads of people still remaining on. So it's not just the numbers you've got, we've got large numbers, but also the numbers that have stayed on to listen to your questions and all the comments, absolutely fascinating. And I, as better than I thought as well, because I was intrigued with the subject. I think it's just lovely, treasures, trophies and trivia. So that's fantastic. So for those who did enjoy it, as Christopher mentioned through his excellent uh, speech, please do buy the book. The fuller stories are in there. And for anybody on 9 or 617, read the book. He's got the facts there. And as you can tell, he's a, a lawyer. So I'm sure he's got his factory, even if you disagree. But other than that, uh, thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, but also for all, all, all attendees, thanks very much. Lovely to see you. Uh, please, uh, it's a free of charge, this, but please, if, if you... Uh, feel generous this evening please do support us as you can imagine during this time at the RAF club is is um, is challenged because we have no visitors and we're very much looking forward to uh, inviting you in through the doors as and when the restrictions um, uh, recede uh, we've got two other ones coming up one uh, which I will do because I have not had a drink since the 1st of January so I, I think I may go to the cheese and wine because I may use that and normally go to the end of February, but I think 24th is a good enough excuse. 24th of February, 6 to 7.30, uh, Stan Lake Park. Please do apply. I think it's before the 18th, but you can do online cheese and wine. They'll send that to you for tasting. And then uh, a very famous, obviously, uh, more recent uh, operation, Operation Blackbuck uh, by Squadron Leader Tuxford. Uh, obviously, the Vulcan bombing in uh, the Falklands Island. 1st of April. Um, so please do uh, go online to the, the club site and apply for that. Uh, so other than that, uh, thank you once again, Christopher. Really fascinating speech. I'm sure very many will uh, buy the book. And thank you one and all and have a wonderful evening. So good night to all. Thank you and good night.